Hallelujah. 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 Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Thank you, Lord. We just thank you so much right now that uh, we can put on the whole armor of God. Yes. We can stand against the wiles of the enemy. Yes. We can put on the breastplate of righteousness. We can have our yes. feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We can take the shield of faith wherewith we're able to pray. Pre- where we're able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. We can take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We can have on the helmet of salvation. Y'all got a helmet on? Yes. Praise God, a helmet. Yes. Praise God, a helmet of salvation. And thank God for the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Father, we thank you so much for this is Resurrection Month. Hallelujah. Yes. March. Hallelujah. We begin our celebration. It's always a celebration of your resurrection, Lord. It's always a celebration of your death, burial, and coming back to life for us. We thank you for the presence of God in our church right now, the presence of God, the goodness of God, the manifestation of God in our midst. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And anyone who agreed said? Amen. 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 Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Go ahead and greet someone, but quickly. (laughs) Thank you, teammates. Welcome, welcome to church. Thank you, Larry. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to service this morning. We're great to, grateful to have all of you with us. And March is, in my life, it's always Resurrection Month because everything's new, fresh, uh, flowers and trees and leaves and all that good stuff. Generally, I think, in uh, the month of March, we still have celebrators celebrating. Hallelujah. Good to have you. Welcome aboard, everyone. Praise God. Good to be in church. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for Resurrection Month, Lord, as we move towards our celebration of life in the month of March, God. We're thankful that we can be in church, Lord. Thank you that here in Minneapolis... It's nice out. Hallelujah. It's, it's, uh, Father, we, uh, we escaped winter this year, and we're thankful for that, Lord. And we're, we're just grateful now we can move into the new life season of flowers and all the blessings that come with March and would come with the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ generally in the month of March. So we're just thankful for all these things, and we're thankful for the Word of God that we're about to receive today, and we just give you all the praise and the glory for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, praise the Lord. Um, Last week we started uh, with a passage of Scripture from Matthew chapter 28. I'm reading from the Amplified Version, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountains, which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. We get to worship our almighty God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But some doubted that it was really him. And Jesus came up and said to them, All authority, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Help the people to learn of me. Help the people to believe in me. Help the people to obey my word, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstance, on every occasion, even to the end of the age. So praise God that uh, this is a wonderful passage where Jesus Uh, says all authority and all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth and 
What else does he say in other places? He says, under the earth. Hallelujah. And so we touched on that a little bit in, uh, in days gone by. But Jesus came in verse 18 and said, All authority, all power of absolute rule on heaven and earth has been given to me. Ultimate authority, ability, and strength. Uh, uh, ability and strength to administer sentence to punishment of rebellious angels who fell and any human who rejects the gospel and follows the devil. What a way to start, huh? But there's so much in what Jesus said, and there's so much in what Jesus did. You know, we traditionally, and we praise God for tradition, where tradition taught us that Jesus at 3 p.m. on, this is what they taught us, or, you know, we, we thought we knew, was that at 3 p.m. on Friday, Jesus died, gave up the ghost, was put on the cross, died, and was buried on sa uh, through Saturday, and on Sunday morning, he rose again from the dead. But Scripture clearly says that he was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so I want to just talk this morning a little bit about what happened in the heart of the earth. And so uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, as we prepare to go that direction, uh, that the, at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth. And so I remember we were discussing, and some had felt that under the earth meant literally somewhere in outer space, far, far down in, the, in that direction, but throughout the scriptures, it talks about the under the earth being under the crust of the earth, inside of the earth, where Jesus went for three days and three nights. And so I want to talk a little bit. I mentioned some things last week about this subject, because, uh, again, in Philippians 2.10, it says, Every knee will bow of things in heaven. Hallelujah. We know heaven is all on board, praise God, for uh, those that have gone before us. And, and uh, uh, there's some amazing things we can talk about right now, but we'll, uh, we'll save that for another moment. Uh, uh, heaven and, of course, on earth where we are, and then under the earth, which would be in the center of the earth which the Bible says that Jesus went for three days and three nights. He said, as the prophet Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so we realize then that the, when we dig deep down through the crust and all the things that are in the layers of the earth, then we get to a compartment in the center of the earth that is, is, uh, is open and that Jesus said in Luke chapter 16 that in there there were several compartments and two of them were a righteous compartment called Abraham's bosom. It was just a compartment where the righteous who had passed would go to and wait for the resurrection of Christ and then for across a great gulf there was a compartment called torment. We've talked about that many times, but just getting the idea here that Jesus said three days and three nights he would be in the heart of the earth. And so I'd like to talk about some things that may be controversial, but of what happened for three days and three nights because it, it strengthens my conviction. It strengthens my Christianity. It strengthens my love for Jesus Christ. Not that the suffering that he endured with nails in his hands and his feet and, and the, 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 sp the spear and the suffering that he endured for our sin, my sin, your sin, our sin, all of our sin. Not that that isn't enough because religion uh, honors that idea that Christ suffered for our sins on the cross. But I want to throw out another idea here. I want to throw out the idea that there was something that had to be done for three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. If the, if, the, if the equation was, and we've talked about this before, but if the equation was Christ died on Friday afternoon, Good Friday, and then was in the grave, 
and then all of Saturday, and then he had to have arisen from the dead before Mary got to the garden, and Mary got there while it was still dark, the Bible says in the book of John, and so if Mary was there when it was still dark, and they don't have uh, save, daylight savings time, so it was very, very early in the morning, so Christ had risen from the dead prior to that already, and so the time frame is a little, there, you know, in different, in different circles, the time frame is a little different, but the fact remains that Jesus Christ died on the cross. So uh, in, in one equation which seems to make sense to me the most is that on the day of Passover, uh, when the Passover lamb had to be slain before, uh, before three in the afternoon, Jesus Christ being the Passover lamb, all the Jewish people who believed would take their little baby lamb that they had and they would take it to the priest and they would slay that, that baby lamb and they'd bring that baby lamb home and they'd have that for the Passover and the Passover would begin that evening. So in order for that to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ, then we would uh, we could venture to wonder if at 3 p.m. on that Wednesday that Christ was in the grave so that at sundown that evening he could be our Passover from Wednesday to Thursday and on, on Thursday to Friday he would be our unleavened bread and on Friday to Saturday he would be the fulfill the weekly Sabbath then at some point after uh, the, on Saturday evening to Sunday morning the Bible says that before it was light Mary had come to the, the tomb and the tomb was already empty so at some time between the uh, fall of darkness to the to sunrise, Jesus Christ had risen from the dead, being three days and three nights. And, and the Bible goes on to say that Jesus Christ was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so that's why I want to just present this idea of what do you do for three days and three nights in the heart of the earth? There's plenty of work that we could consider that Jesus did while he was there. But going back to this thought here of Philippians 2.10 that says uh, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in the earth, and things under the earth or inside the earth. Every knee in the inside of the earth will bow. What generally would we conclude is in the inside of the earth? It is the compartment that we call where the, the, those who have rejected Christ in their life or those who have gone into that compartment are in hell in the torment compartment of hell. We don't talk about the torment compartment of hell very often, but we need to. We all need to have a healthy respect for what Jesus Christ did on the cross, and we, we do thank God for religion that teaches us what happened, but they don't teach you what Jesus did for three days and three nights in that compartment in hell. All right, so as we go forward, it said in Philippians 2.10 that things under the earth, and then Jesus said, in Revelation 5, or the Bible says in Revelation 5, 3, that no man in heaven nor earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon except the Lord himself. So we know that in the book of Revelation, the book that uh, was opened and Jesus uh, unfolded it for us in our understanding, but it, it starts with no person in heaven and no person on earth, no person under the earth except Jesus himself was able to open that book. So we understand again that this is a confirmation that there is a, a topic of under the earth. And I'm going there to talk about what is under the earth because in my estimation, it just is just all the more incredible what Jesus Christ did. It's, it is enough. It is enough that uh, he died on the cross, shed his blood, he had nails he was nailed to that cross. He suffered, and between, uh, between noon and three, darkness is on the face of the earth, and we, we don't know. Some, some say that that is at the point where uh, the, 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 the sun went dark so that nobody could see that God put all the sin of mankind on Jesus and what caused him to be uh, in that, that state where it went dark. That's, that's, that, that's awesome. That's praise God. But there's more to the story. And so I'm sharing my thoughts 
thoughts on what the rest of the story is. And uh, several times we have that rest reference to what is under the earth. In Matthew 18, 16, just a rule of thumb here, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established so that if we get some ideas from the Bible that we can confirm it out of the mouth of two or three places in the Bible. If you get a revelation of something in the Bible, you want to search the scriptures. You want to make sure that out of the mouth of two or three, every word will be established so that you can find that in your Bible and you can rest assured, hey, it's great for your faith when you get a promise from God that you can find it in several places. It may not be word for word. It may be just a reference or a, or a, a help, but generally you can find at least two or three places in your word where, where in the word where it will confirm the, 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 the ideas that God, the Holy Spirit, will present to us. Some would say amen while I catch my breath. Amen. All right, so there's a, there's a certain graphic nature to some of this, and um, you could, we could skip it. But I think we've progressed to the point where we can handle it. And I just want to uh, continue into this, that uh, being uh, in, in this, this subject of uh, three places of heaven, which is stars, universe, and where God's throne is. And uh, we don't really know a lot about it, and, uh, but it's a fascinating study and a subject. And then earth, of course, of the world, terra firma, where we're at right now. And then number third place is under earth. And we know from under earth that there are three names of punishment in the underworld, the subterranean or the inf inf uh, infernal place uh, called hell, Sheol, and Hades. All right, those are three uh, names that we get from Hebrew and the Greek of hell, Sheol, and Hades. And we know that all the bad angels and humans still exist because spirits are eternal. Your spirit is eternal. And that's why we, are, we, we sometimes... We're so strong in our presentation to get people saved because spirits are eternal. And so we want you to be eternally with God for eternity rather than eternally separated from him. Humans don't cease to exist. Spirits don't cease to exist. When you were created, you were eternal from that point on, and you'll always exist, and there's no ex extinguishing your light or life, but there will be uh, one place or another, and all the bad angels and humans that did not accept Christ as their Savior, they still exist. They still exist and are incarcerated in the torment compartment of the Old Testament Sheol or the New Testament Hell, Hades, or Torment, and they're all located in the heart of the earth. So... God's angels that sinned with Lucifer, Satan, and the devil, who led a rebellion of heaven. In the dateless past, these rebels were cast down to hell in a place called Tartarus, T-A-R-T-A-R-U-S. It's the prison of fallen angels. So the rebellion, these angels were sent into a compartment in hell. We know that, again, in Luke 16, there was one compartment called Abraham's bosom for the righteous, and we know there was another compartment called torment, but now we know, according to this, that the angel's in a third compartment. And so we know that uh, there is some space in the, in the center of the earth, and that that is where these compartments are, and we believe that the Bible tells us from Genesis to Revelation that there are these underworld chambers in the earth and we don't need science to confirm it. We, how, how, what, how are we going to get science to confirm this? Because we don't, they don't know what's down there. They tried to dig down. They tried to listen. But the Bible tells us this. This is the Bible telling us that there are these compartments in the center of the earth. And uh, we know that this infernal region inside the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ plainly states that we should believe that he was there, that Jesus Christ was there. And I, I want to ask you, 
I want to ask us as Christians to believe that Jesus Christ was there. How, how do you know that Jesus Christ was there? Well, you hear me say it all the time in Matthew 12, 40. He said, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. So general Christianity goes, that's not possible, so we don't accept that, and so that must not be the interpretation. But I take things literally first. And if you take things literally first, Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So we ask each other, what was Jesus doing in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights? And so we believe that the Bible says Christ paid for our sin. And in torment, he talked about the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. And we know that when Jesus rose from the dead, he collected Abraham's bosom. Let's just believe that for a minute because it's scripture, it's scriptural, that Jesus collected all those that were awaiting the resurrection. The reason that people uh, before Jesus went down to Abraham's bosom was because they were awaiting the resurrection. They looked forward to the resurrection of Christ. And when Christ was raised from the dead, he went down into the center of the earth uh, for three days and three nights. And that's quite a long time in, in, in that time. But he took that compartment called Abraham's bosom. Uh, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians that he led captivity. They were held against their will up up until that point, they were held against their will by the enemy, and so there was this paradise compartment where they weren't suffering, they were just waiting. In paradise, they were waiting for the resurrection of Christ, and so when Jesus said, it is finished, and then the Bible says that it went dark, and Jesus went, and, he, and what did Jesus do prior to uh, taking uh, captivity captive? What did Jesus do before he went down into there, and what did he do before he took and led captivity captive according? to the book of Ephesians and he gave gifts to men and he took those people that were down into that place who were waiting patiently for the resurrection of Jesus Christ to liberate, liberate that compartment and take Abraham's bosom to heaven. And so I suggest to you today and it's not, it can be, people can challenge that, they do. Some people still believe that Abraham's bosom is there but there's no need to. Because now, as a person that accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the moment they die, they don't go down to Abraham's bosom. They go directly to the presence of the Lord in heaven. So those of, us, so those of our families or our friends or people that we know who have accepted Christ and have passed away, we can rejoice. We can celebrate that the greatest place in the universe is where they went. And so there's, there, there's God, God, God wipes away every tear that might have been on their faces, and they're in the presence of the joy of the Lord forevermore. And so we, we rejoice with those, and so we don't need science to confirm what the Bible Bible tells us because the more we study our Bible and we, the more we understand what happened, then all of a sudden science comes along and all of a sudden they're discovering that what we're, what we're presenting is truth. It's always been truth. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we know what happened to those who have gone on before us. So in Matthew 20, 40, again, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus, himself, Jesus Christ himself is the creator and architect of the entire universe, universe according to what the Bible says, and all life and matter exists in him, for him, and through him, and for thy pleasure they are created. Colossians 1, 10, 17 says, and he is before all things. Someone said, well, Jesus was born of Mary. No, no, he was before all things. He was God. He's God the second person. God the Father, first person. Jesus Christ, second person. Holy Spirit, third person. He is, he is God from the beginning, and before, he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He's the architect. 
He's does, he holds all things by the word of his power. We know the Father does, but Jesus, I and my Father are one. We know that the Father, God in three persons, Father, Holy, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, therefore, and he is before all things, and all, by him all things consist. All things are made by him and for him and through him. Hallelujah. In Jude, going back to our subject of the angels, Jude tells us information that is fascinating. He says in one, six of, uh, one chapter of Jude, or six verse, the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he's reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that great day. So we know that when the angels fell, there was a group that followed Satan. And, and I don't have an answer to this question. Maybe somebody can whisper it to me on the way out or show it to me or whatever. But um, why... We know that Satan is still loose, but the really, really wicked angels, they are, right now, they are reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that day. In verse 7 of Jude, it says, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these have given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh are set forth an example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude doesn't pull any punches here. Verse 8, likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh. They reject authority and they speak evil of dignities. We'll skip 9 just for moving forward here. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know and whatever they know naturally like brute beasts in these things they corrupt themselves verse 11 woe to them for they have gone in the way of Cain and have, and have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah alright so let's evaluate what Jude is telling us here just for our information about why, why would we do this because up front in this month of March I want to present this so that as we move towards the cross we celebrate the cross we celebrate the resurrection we celebrate Christ's death, burial, and resurrection we know these things and we can move forward and, and celebrate with the whole earth but this is not normally presented in this subject and so we, if we look here at what this subject here of uh, they perished in the rebellion of Korah who was Korah? Uh, Korah? The earth opened up and swallowed an entire group of rebellious people of Korah who went alive into the underworld. So right now, think about it. The Bible says that the followers of Korah, the earth opened up and all these people fell in and they fell all the way down into the center of the earth where there is that, those other compartments. And so there are people that went down there alive. So the question is, did they die on the way down in the fall, or are they, well, we know their spirits are alive, but natural human people, actually, the, the earth opened, and they fell down into that place. Number 16.5 tells us the story. Moses spoke to Korah and unto his company, saying, even tomorrow the Lord will show us who are his and who are holy, and who, and who will cause him to come near unto him, even him who has chosen, whom he has chosen, will he cause to come near to him. Numbers 9, 16, 19. And Korah gathered all of his group, his congregation, against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto the whole congregation. And in verse 26 of Numbers 16, Moses spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men of Korah, and touch not their, nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed by their sins. So there's a standoff between Moses and Korah. Korah's got a group of followers, and Moses has a group of followers. The righteous are following Moses. The unrighteous are following Korah. And God shows them who he chooses. In uh, verse 16, again, uh, Moses is warning the people of Korah. He says, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and don't touch anything of theirs, lest you be consumed in their sin. Numbers 16.32 says, The earth opened its mouth, and when earth opened its mouth, it swallowed them, the earth did, and their houses and all the men or the people that appertained unto Korah and all of their goods. Took everything, boom. Took everything that belonged to that group of rebellious people and they went the the main point that I'm emphasizing today this is clear enough for anybody to understand what happened but they went down alive into the center of the earth 
most people, when you die, your spirit goes to heaven if you're a Christian or your spirit goes to hell if you're not a Christian. And we're not afraid to talk about these things because this is, this is, this is absolute truth. Thank you. This is absolute Christianity to know that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. One of the greatest leaders of the body of Christ would say that every single time he spoke. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And here in this issue between Moses and Korah and the people of Korah, they, I don't even know if it's some, some places the New Testament has an E with an emphasis as a long E, so Cori. So I don't know if it's Korah, Cori, or however you want to pronounce it, but in the context of the King James, it's K-O-R-A-H. And so in this context, the, all of these people, they went straight down. The earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their house and all the, these men that pertained to Korah, Cori, and all their goods. So when I hear a story like that, In the olden days for Christianity, they would say, take heed to the warning. And to me, it was healthy Christianity. And modern Christianity says, oh, no, man, don't, don't, you know, don't think about stuff like that. Well, listen, we have to examine our ways. We have to evaluate our hearts. We cannot play or gamble with our eternal life and our eternal future. And then some people, well, well, I profess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I am guaranteed a place in heaven. Well, if all of your fruit contradicts your confession, is your confession going to outweigh all your fruit? Bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. That's what John the Baptist said. Other people say, well, you got to have John the Baptist. He, he was before Jesus. But he said some really righteous things. And the point that I'm making is that we evaluate these things. They're in some, some, of, the, some of the writers are very gracious and kind and, and they, they offer a, a, a nonstop grace. And then there are other writers like Jude. He pulls no punches and he tells you there's, some, there's heaven to gain and hell to shun. And we're, 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 we're telling about hell that in the Old Testament people went there and the New Testament people go there and there are people that are alive that have went down into the earth and they're there and they're the angels that sinned. The Bible says that, that there was a group of angels that, that disobeyed God and came down to earth. And it was before the flood, and that's what all, the, that, all the, the stuff that you're hearing about before the flood and all the gods and all the stuff, they're just the angels that fell. And so they're down there, and they're in chains in a different compartment. It's T-A-R-T-A-R-U-S, Tartarus. It's a place for, it's a compartment for the fallen angels. And basically the worst of the worst. So we know that there, are, there, there were three places, and there might be even more, but, you know, as we do our, our research, but 2 Corinthians chapter 2 confirms this point that it says, wherefore, okay, this is Corinthians. This is the Apostle Paul. This is straightforward New Testament good stuff. And Paul says this. He says, wherefore, come out from among them. Now, he doesn't bring up uh, the, the people of Korah. He doesn't say that there. But he says, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. And, and says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. Amplify, it says, come out from among unbelievers. Don't be like unbelievers. Let there be a separation. Let there be an identification. Let there be fruit. Could they tell? Can they tell if you're different from the world? I'm saved, but I'm exactly like the world. No, I'm saved and I'm nothing like the world. Take your choice. Make your choice. Make your choices. Choose ye this day. Who said that? It was um, uh, Joshua. Joshua said it. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm going to come out from among them and I'm going to be separate 
not because I think I'm better, because I, but because I know that I don't want to live in the fruit of the darkness of what the, the world is. And right now, Christianity is just mix-mashed. It's all mixed up, and people are so, you know, so, well, we're going out into all the world, and we're preaching the gospel to every creature, and we're hanging out, and we're, you know, uh, who knows, are we uh, drinking with them and smoking weed with them and doing drugs with them and, and fornicating and doing all these things, but we just want them to know we love them, and we want them to come into the church. Smoking weed, doing drugs, drinking and fornicating is so contrary to common sense Christianity and yet how much of the church is living that way because we've extended this carpet. I'm in favor of all. Man, the pe- those of you that have this incredible gift of grace, God, you're, the, you're awesome to be around. We love you. You're, you're, you're blessed and you're highly favored and you're excellent and, and you have that gift of extending the grace of God. Not that I don't, but I'm more of a black and white Tell me the truth. Don't sugarcoat anything. Give it to me straight. I want to know what's going on and what I need to do and what I need to get out from. Come out from among them and be separate. And touch not. This is from what Moses said. He, there was Korah. He said, we don't want what you're serving. We'll do it ourselves. Come out from doing it yourself and be separate, saith the Lord. So amplified again, so come out from among unbelievers and separate or sever. Why does amplified say sever? Sever is a gross word. They severed some of my muscles in order to put in a fake knee. And I love my fake knee, thank God. Thank you for your prayers of support. I can, I can boogie if I want to. But they severed. I, I said to him, I said, hey, what'd they do with the muscles? It just doesn't really make sense. He said, severed. I didn't want to hear it that way. I want to say, no, we, we politely kind of moved them out of the way and we just folded them under nicely and we worked around them. No, chop, they severed it. He didn't pull punches, man. He said, we severed it. I sewed it. He said, I sewed it back. It's real. That's what happens to be severed. So the Amplified says, sever yourselves from them, says the Lord, and touch not any unclean thing. You know, that's Old Testament language, but it's in the New Testament. It's in 2 Corinthians. Paul is telling the, the Corinthian church, touch not the unclean thing, and, I'll res- and God will receive you kindly and treat you with favor. All of us want favor. We all want the favor of God, the grace of God, the blessing of God. Uh, We want God to prosper us and heal us and and do all the great things for us. And he's saying, come out from among them and and, uh, touch not the unclean thing and I'll receive you unto myself. So it's a call for us as these, these interesting things tell us going forward here. Let me just pick up where we left off here. So back in Numbers 16, 32, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and their people and their, that all things that appertained to Korah and all of their goods. And the followers of Korah were swallowed alive straight down to the place of under earth, which is the underworld of subterranean, infernal world of humans that inhabit hell. The human inhabitants of the Old Testament called Sheol or New Testament Hades, including angels that sinned and were cast down to Tartarus. We pr- talked about that. The prison of fallen angels with the demons of the abyss. So Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. This is a testimony of fact that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, that Jesus Christ went into hell. He defeated all the enemies of God and is now seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. 1 Peter 3.22 said, "Who Jesus who is gone into the heaven is on the right hand of God uh, of angels, authorities, and powers being made subject unto him. Peter said, 
in 1 Peter 3, 18, 19, and 8, uh, 3, 18 and 19, for Christ also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. The prison of the, the Septuagint says uh, the enclosure of confinement, a guarded place of being watched. Jesus went down there, and I... I'll, I'll, I'll not go that there yet. Uh, into this prison... Hebrews 1, 3 says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, Jesus is upholding all things by the word of his power when he, he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. The question is, and it's, it's a discussion that is interesting, what did Jesus do in hell for three days and three nights? We know that he went into that compartment where the angels that sinned were chained and he, he told them that I am, I am God, I am the Almighty. And he said, your punishment is eternal. That is one of the toughest things I can tell you right now, that their punishment is eternal. And for the other compartments, I don't know if there's some religions that mention that you know, there, there were ways to pay and to get people out of hell. Uh, I forgot what the term is for it, but it was back in the old days that, that maybe you could get out of there, get out of those compartments. But this life is where you decide where you will spend eternity. And if God were to show us, all of us, heaven, it would be a slam dunk. Slam dunk is the easiest basket you can make. You just run up, jump up, and slam dunk it. You guys know that. Well, it's a slam dunk that if we saw heaven, if we tasted heaven in, in the, uh, what, what, is, what it's like to leave this existence, no one would deny it. Everybody would say, yes, absolutely. But we come back here to decide where I'm going to spend my eternity. And this is, this is an Easter message. And I'm doing it up front so that we can get to the, down the, down the road, we can get closer to the, the, the traditional presentation of what happened. But this is truth from the scripture as to what happened. So um, here's a question that I think, if there are angels that fell and they're locked in chains in that compartment, why isn't the devil there? And, you know, it's, he didn't, he wasn't a participant to that degree, and he's still loosed, and he'll be loosed until Revelation 20. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Satan is now the god of this world who's blinded the minds of unbelievers, Ephesians 2, 2 says he's the prince of the power of the air. Hey, Christians, if he's the prince of the power of the air, the atmosphere, and we know that there are principalities and there are powers, there are rulers of the darkness of this world, and there is spiritual wickedness in high places, that in the atmosphere we're in, this is the domain, according to the Apostle Paul, and according to Scripture, that, that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. So when you cross over from our atmosphere out into outer space, it's fascinating what astronauts tell you. They tell you, and they've went on the record to say, they experience this incredible joy, this incredible peace, and what it suggests is that these principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and this spiritual wickedness in high places is limited to the atmosphere so that when you get outside, they said, you know, uh, I watched some of those documentaries. I love those documentaries. They're really old. This is old information. But it was just on yesterday or the day before where the Russian cosmonauts, they saw angels. 
all six of them in that spaceship. They're outside of the, outside of the earth uh, in orbit, and he, they saw angels. And they all came back testifying with joy that the peace that came over them was nothing like they had experienced, and they saw out their windows of their spacecraft six angels. And then in the documentary, out the window, they simply put, you know those, those uh, stencils that you put on your windows at Christmas where you've got the angel-looking shape? They, they kind of stenciled those out on this picture of the uh, spacecraft looking out as six angels of light, just filled with light. They were just outlines of these, these angels with wings filled with light. And the, the, the funny thing about it to me is that Russia is so secretive and they're so... They're, they, they won't, they're so godless as a, as an, uh, as a nation in, from their leadership. And yet for those cosmonauts to come back and not be ashamed or afraid to testify to anybody that would listen, that when they were out in outer space, they had these euphoric feelings of joy and peace and that they were protected. And all of a sudden they saw, all of them in the ship saw six angels. I love it. I think it's an awesome thing to testify of. And uh, if they could say that, then I think we all need to uh, consider the idea that they weren't hallucinating, that they were seeing the protection of God outside the atmosphere. And that's the point I was making. It seems that outside the atmosphere, that principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places, high places being limited to our atmosphere, it seems to suggest. And that's why the anomalies and all the weird stuff that's going on, the Bible said that uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness, that we are in a war with these types of uh, these, these entities. And so for people to testify that they're having these weird experiences, hey, listen, when Back in the day, some of the, some of the stuff that you'd take or some of the stuff you'd smoke, I mean, there was a lot of weird stuff that would go on, and people would go, well, you were just high. You didn't, you didn't see anything. You didn't experience anything. Now, all of a sudden, it just seems like, hey, that's very possible because the, 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 the veil between the, the, what is available here at the end times is all of a sudden becoming more real and more real for many, many people. It's a, it's a call. It's a call for people to humble themselves and admit this stuff is not uh, make-believe. This is real, that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, and that there are principalities, there are powers, there are fallen rulers of the darkness of this world. There is spiritual wickedness in high places that we're dealing with, but thank God, because of the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God's Word, we wrestle not against that flesh and blood we or, or, or those spirits. We are strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. All right, so going forward, uh, the, the spirits that work in the children of disobedience, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says, No marvel, don't marvel at this is real, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So even if he, it was just him alone, he moves at the speed of light. He's a spirit. Or I don't know the spirit, whatever spiritual, whatever speed spirits move at. So he can be all around in a lot of, really fast. But there are his associates and they're doing that work that they are, they, they're doing. And uh, he's the God of this world. He's blinded the minds of unbelievers. He's the prince of the power of the air. Uh, he, he works in the children of disobedience. He can transform into an angel of light. In Revelation 20, it says that his final punishment for the adversary, the devil, Satan, the deceiver, and enemy, verse 1 through 3, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Thank God for God's angels. And he took and he cast him in the bottomless pit, that is being the devil, and he shut him up and he set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a little season. So that's what the Bible says that that's what's going to happen in Revelation uh, 20, verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Revelation 20, 10 says, The devil that deceived them eventually will 
be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast, the false prophet are, and he and the beast and the false prophet shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's what scripture says from Revelation 20.10. So as we prepare here to close the message, our faith declares that uh, God said it, scripture confirms it, therefore I believe it, I receive it. Jesus, 1 Peter 3.22, Jesus who's gone into heaven is at the right hand of God. The angels, authorities, and powers are made subject to him. So God is in control of it all. Jesus is in control. He's on his throne. Nothing is happening that he's not aware of. We don't have to fear. We don't have to be worried or anything like that. And uh, one more couple verses here, and then we'll close. Jesus said in Mark 12, 24, your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. I'm not suggesting that our people don't know the scriptures or our people don't know the power of God. But we want everyone to know the scriptures. And we want everyone to know the power of God. And we want everyone to have it settled in their hearts and in their minds and in their life that there is, as I've stated several times, heaven to gain and hell to shun. And I, I'm troubled and I state this very commonly that I'm troubled by the direction that a lot of things are moving in spiritual life. And I want to always present to the best of my ability clarity on the direction of Christians and where and what is expected of us in our Christian walk. And to reject and say no to darkness, to I think that's pretty clear in itself, to reject and say no to every form of darkness in our life. And therefore, lastly, in Matthew 28, 18, actually I've got two verses left. Jesus said, all power is given unto me, divine power being dunamis, we know that word, why? First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5, so that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Christians, there is power available for us in the Scripture, in faith in the Scripture, in the power of God in the Scripture. And I just want to make sure that I continue to remind every person that we stay in the Word. The power of God from the word of God into our spirit to come forth in our life, to come forth to people around us, to come forth to people we know and love and people we don't know, that we could walk in the spirit, that we could, well, there it goes again, walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh, to be doers of the word, not just hearers only. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things to be added unto us so that we know, I know in whom I believed, and I know where I'm going if I die. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll let Pastor share some thoughts before we pray the salvation prayer. Well, we know that Jesus took back the keys to death, hell, and the grave. Amen. You can't deny that he whipped the devil in his own territory. He paid the price. Probably was preaching to Abraham's bosom so they could accept him, right? Or some train of thought is because they were walking around on the earth that they had Ma to accept Jesus. Yeah. After he rose again, the graves were opened up. People were wandering around on the earth. They saw dead people walking around. Um, that they probably had to get born again in their bodies before they could go Depa to heaven. Depart. Right? Um, That's good. I forgot that part. Yeah. Thank you. I'm here to help. Absolutely you are. <laughs> We're a team. But every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess. So no matter 
everyone in the heart of the earth confessed. They just didn't have a way out. So we always want to make sure that we do our part to give people an opportunity and to tell them the truth. I had no idea what he was going to talk on today, but Sam, do you want to put up that little thing, that picture I sent you? Can you put that up for me? There's a broad road that leads to destruction. Wow. There's a narrow road that leads to life. And a lot of times we think about that in context of, you know, the way of the world, right? But this morning when I woke up, I had to search for that picture. I was thinking about it in the context of there's a lot of Christianity, and you touched on it, people that call themselves Christians, but the fruit of their life, there's no difference. You can't tell that they're, that they're different, that wow. they're separate wow. in any way because the fruit of their life looks just like the world. And we want to be on the other, we want to be on that other road so that we can tell people the truth. The whole three days and three nights in the heart of the earth and getting the timeline right. People are smart, right? So you get somebody who knows that scripture in the Bible or knows about that scripture in the Bible, and then they look at religion that says, well, Jesus died on Friday and he rose on Thursday. I don't know. Most of us in here can do basic, simple math. And then they start asking questions and nobody can answer the question. We want to be able to answer the questions and take people back to scripture. And what's interesting too is when you when you plug in the equation that Pastor Steve was talking about, Jesus was our Passover lamb. He fulfilled that feast. And the Sabbaths and the timing of all of that is perfect. Because God's timing is perfect. Well, since you brought it up, may I just interject? Yeah, the equation doesn't work. Passover, 24 hours. Unleavened bread, 24 hours. The Friday Sabbath, 24 hours, would put you in after 6 p.m. on Saturday or sunset, and therefore the Bible says after, after the Passover, or after the Sabbath, Christ rose from the dead, after the Sabbath. So it was after 6 p.m. on Saturday night. And so within that window, when Mary was there before the tomb in the dark, somewhere in that window, well, well it was the next day, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So the equation fits, and I just wanted well, to... Well, and if you think about it like this, we think about our days as morning to night. But the Jews think about their days. 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. So it's night first and then morning. And when you understand that, then some of this stuff begins to make sense. So it, it's, it's fun. He asked me the other day, what was Jesus doing? And I'm like, he was just whipping the devil, man. <laughs> Not hard for me to believe because that's what the Bible says. He took the keys. Satan thought he won. The Bible says that if he would have known what was going to happen, he never would have crucified, crucified the, the Lord, Lord of, of glory. glory. He didn't know. It had been kept secret. And so Satan thought when Jesus went to the cross, ha ha, I've won. Have you ever watched like a football game or something and you think the the opposing team is going to win it, and then at the last second, your team wins, that's, hey, we won. We won. We have the victory. We need to know who we are in Christ. And we need to help people Praise that God. are caught up on the wrong road. You know, there's a, there's a point there where people have a choice. Why is Satan still loose? Because we have a choice. If you don't have evil, how are you going to know good? It wouldn't be a choice. If there weren't temptations to choose the wrong thing, you wouldn't have a choice. God wanted people that would choose him. He wanted a family that would choose to love him, choose to obey him, choose to follow him. 
And so we choose. We choose. We get to choose. Hallelujah. We get to choose. Praise God. So Ch Choose you this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we, we will, will serve, serve the Lord. Lord. Amen. Let's say the salvation prayer. All right. Dear God in heaven. Dear God in heaven. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross for me. I believe that he died on the cross for me. And was raised again from the dead. And was raised again from the dead. So that I could have eternal life. So that I could have eternal life. Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. And be my Lord. And be my Lord. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I receive forgiveness now. I receive forgiveness now. I receive eternal life. I receive eternal life. And I thank and praise you for it. And I thank and praise you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks Amen. for your help. Yeah, you're welcome, honey. That's what I do. We help each other. Amen. Well, um, we're going to receive the, the morning offering. And just a reminder, daylight savings time next Saturday, which I thought they did away with. You know, they talk about it every single year that they're going to do away with it, and I wish they would because we're going to spring forward. If you just think about that, you're going to spring forward next week, which means we actually lose an hour of sleep. So what we do just to help ourselves out is we actually set our clocks forward early on Saturday, whichever ones we can. You know, a lot of times you're like your cell phones and your Apple watches and all that kind of stuff. It will automatically adjust and you don't want to accidentally go whatever. But if you have an old fashioned clock, turn it ahead so you actually go to bed a little bit earlier and that way you won't be an hour late for church. So daylight savings, Melissa will post it on, uh, on um, whatchamacallit, Facebook, thank you. Uh, ladies, we are meeting Saturday here at the church at 11 o'clock for lunch, so you are welcome. We'll have a really good time of prayer. All right, we're going to receive the offering. Deuteronomy, let's see, where was I? Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. But you shall earnestly remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall perish. And we're not going to perish if we don't remember God. But what I love about this is that God is the one who gives us the ability to get wealth. And if we jump over to the New Testament, it's very similar to what Jesus said, Pastor said it. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Matthew 6, 21. Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Verse 24, no one can serve two ma masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. It's talking about loving God or loving mammon, which is the world's version of money, right? You're either going to hate the one and love the other, or he will stand by and be devoted to the one and despise against the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, deceitful riches, money, possessions, or whatever is trusted in. So God is the one who gives us the ability for wealth. He's not against wealth. He's not against us having our needs met. He's not against us having more than enough. Why? Because if you have more than enough, you can be generous on every occasion. You can be a blessing. It's hard to be a blessing if you don't have anything. So God wants us to be a blessing. He just wants us to have everything in proper order. And it's just having a right Bible understanding of these things. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we have an opportunity in the offering to give. God promises that he'll give us bread for food, meet your needs, and he'll give you seed to sow. Sow the seed, don't eat your seed, right? You can eat your bread. But don't eat your seed. You want to sow your seed so that God can multiply it and bring it back to you. And increase comes. And that's the kingdom way of finance. And so as we give this morning, we just, you know, your giving has to be between you and God. Pastor Steve and I don't have access to the offerings. We don't. And we don't want to. Right? But it's for your benefit and for your good that you participate in kingdom finance. So, Father, thank you so much for... Your word that says that you give all of us the power to get wealth. Give us wisdom, Lord, 
to know how to use the gifts and talents and the things that you've given each one of us, that we would do it for your kingdom and for your glory, and that there would be increase in our lives that would cause thanks and thanksgiving and praise and honor to you. As we give this morning, we do so with a cheerful heart. And God, I thank you for meeting the needs of your people and for increasing the fruits of our righteousness, increasing the, the things that come into this church so that we can continue to be a blessing. We thank you for the ministries as a congregation that we support. We pray that they would have their needs met. Thank you for meeting the needs of this church. And thank you for meeting the needs of the people of this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, again, ladies, uh, Saturday at 11 o'clock, you are all invited. We're doing a, a whole variety of salads. And then um, the end of the month, if you are someone who loves to make cornbread, has a special dessert, or you would like to make chili, we're going to do a congregation chili thing again, and we've got three or four chilies already. We could probably use one more. Uh, cornbread, dessert, whatever, and as people want to participate and bring stuff, it was super fun. We did one um, a couple of months ago, and it was really great. So if you've got a special chili or you know how to make good cornbread and you want to participate or whatever, come talk to me after church, and otherwise have a, have a blessed week. We'll see you Wednesday night, 7 o'clock.